Hi, I'm Matt and you are on the Living Droplets channel. Today we're going to talk about something that may not make you happy, but it's a very important topic right now. You're hearing more and more about it in the media and all over the place. It's artificial intelligence. You probably know ChatGPT or Midjourney for images and many other programs that were built to make your life easier. But all of these programs also worry you and sometimes they make you wonder if we are not going to be replaced by AIs or if it's normal to have AIs, uh, if it's not an unnatural process, etc. Uh, but because it's a hot topic right now, you might be thinking, oh, please, not artificial intelligence again. We are too much about it and we'd like to hear about something else for once. But you're hearing about it in a certain way and I actually have a slightly different perspective on it that I'd like to share with you. So every time I talk about it with people around me, the same questions or thoughts always come up. It's always AIs will replace mankind, but they can feel emotions. So mankind will disappear and it will become something cold. Or AI will take our jobs. Or AIs aren't humans, so or it's not natural. Or I feel things, I have a soul, whereas machines don't have a soul, machines don't have emotions or feelings. But when we say I have emotions, I have feelings, I have a soul, whereas machines don't, we actually say that because we've grown up like this since we were little, and because we've always felt things that way. We never asked ourselves how the human body perceives things and how they are transformed into sensations, emotions, feelings, and so on. We feel things inside our body in a certain way, in our own envelope, because we perceive them with our skin, our eyes, and many other sensory organs. But we don't wonder what happened. We don't wonder how we detected the outside world and how we interpreted it inside our body and in our brain. But when you study biology or when you're interested in figuring this out, uh, you soon realize that everything we perceive is just a signal. Something happens outside and it's transmitted and translated inside our body in the form of electrical impulses. And our brain receives all these electrical impulses, mixes them with each other and organizes them in a way to give them a given value, a given hierarchy. So when you say I feel something or I perceive something or I have feelings, it's because something happened outside of your body and it stimulated your skin or your eyes or your ears, for instance. Uh, you heard something, you felt something, you perceived a signal that was outside your body, and this signal was transmitted to your brain, and your brain constructed a mental image of the outside world. And when your body does that, it records this information in a way to remember that such an external event corresponds to such a stimulation in your body. This is very important because it allows you to adapt. It allows you to find the things you need outside your body to make it work. You need food, you need water, you need air, you need many things for your body to continue functioning. And to find them, your body must know that such a signal in the outside world corresponds to this thing that allows you to function. It remembers that these are the signals that allow you to survive. And on the other hand, there are also signals that are dangerous for you and that can prevent your body from functioning and your brain must remember these signals as well. So when we say I feel something, I perceive something, it's actually your brain that has received a signal from the outside and recorded it to make it correspond to something that is happening inside. Now, when we say we have a soul, when we say we have feelings, when we say we have emotions, the same thing actually happens, but at a higher level of hierarchy. So to understand this, you have to realize that at the basis level, we initially react through survival reflexes, uh, things we cannot help but do. So we cannot stop breathing, we cannot stop our heart from beating, etc. Because otherwise we will die. However, we can add something on top of these first reaction layers to give them nuance. To try to extract the same benefit, but further in time or space. This is different from a situation where someone would suddenly slap you when you cross paths, for instance. In this case, you would react almost uh, reflexively for survival because the person has entered this zone around you that uh, roughly corresponds to the length of your arms and legs, which is the area where you feel protected. Indeed, when you can push something away from you with your arms or your legs, it puts your body at a distance from danger. 
Thus, we have a kind of zone around us where we have difficulty accepting that something is approaching. So if, for example, someone slaps you or suddenly enters this zone, you have a survival or protective reflex. It triggers adrenaline rushes and many conditions in your body that will cause you to react reflexively uh, to protect the envelope that contains who you are. But we can complexify and enrich this process by considering that I'm not going to experience something immediately. I'm not going to be in an immediate danger. But I know that if this happens, plus this, plus this, with this person at this place, etc., I am at risk. By memorizing more things, we can remember that we have been able to get something that was not directly here. But by doing multiple actions, combining several events, we have been able to obtain something. For example, you could say, I talked to a certain person and they told me they liked something, I brought it to them, and to thank me, they gave me something in return. This is not something that happens to us directly. These are chains of consequences that become longer and longer. And these chains of consequences, if combined with even more people, more interactions, more things, will result in reactions and behaviors that will not be immediate reflexes. These behaviors will be spread out in time and space to allow us to obtain a benefit, but in the long run. And also a benefit that is more difficult to identify at first. And those kinds of behaviors are what we call emotions and feelings. So when you say, I feel something, I have a soul, I have feelings, and a machine doesn't, you actually need to ask yourself, what does it mean to feel something, to have soul, to have feelings? All of this has to be based on physical functioning. It has to rely on atoms, on signals, on elements of matter that interact with other elements of matter. But as long as we don't know how this works, as long as we don't know which element interacts with which, or what sequence of events will lead to such a thing or such a functioning in our body, we usually give it a meaning or look for an explanation that is fantastic, magical, imaginary. We imagine a functioning. In the past, in Greek mythology, for example, things were explained with certain gods. But now we know how these things work, and we no longer believe that some gods make the celestial vault turn, for example, because we have understood the functioning of matter. And the more we understand how matter works, the less we see things that seem supernatural or mystical, such as soul, as something mystical. And the more we understand how they work, the more we can reproduce them. And this is what's happening with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is the ability of machines to learn, are based on our understanding of how the brain works and how our body interprets signals. As we've seen, the body receives and interprets external signals, memorizes them, and makes them interact with each other. It combines this signal with another signal that already existed, which is a memory. So, for example, it remembers something and knows that if there is this memory and it's put in contact with this situation, something might happen because it has already happened this way before. All of our reactions are therefore only a cascading chain of consequences of the contacts that are occurring between one signal and another. And we can actually reproduce this in a computer, which is what's happening right now. So it's no surprise that a machine can think or perceive the world in the same way that we do. So when you say I'm different from a machine because I can feel things and I have a soul, you feel different from a machine because you perceive them with other sensors. You perceive them with biological sensors and you give them a meaning that matches the envelope in which you find yourself. You perceive an external event with your eyes, which detect a certain frequency of light, and you give it a meaning that corresponds to what it does inside your body, or what it has already done inside your body, to either bring you nutrients or to put you in danger. So depending on whether it brings positive or negative outcomes, you remember that signal and what it brings to you. And a machine will do exactly the same thing. 
it will capture that signal with other sensors that detect external events, but in a different way and at different frequencies. It can of course detect our frequencies, that's how we can talk over the internet and now I'm sending you this video for instance, because we've created electronic sensors that can retrieve sound and visual frequencies that correspond to those detected by our eyes and our ears. So you can see and hear me in a way that matches what your body can do. But there are also many other ways to perceive the world that you are not capable of perceiving with your biological body because you don't have the proper sensors. So you can detect those signals and your brain isn't capable of processing them. But to feel is just to perceive the outside world and make a mental representation of it to know what it brings to us or not. And a machine can do exactly the same thing. It can perceive the outside world and know what it will bring to it or not. So there isn't a really fundamental difference between a thinking machine and a human being. The difference lies only in the type and quantity of information that you can detect and process. And what worries humanity now is that these machines can detect everything we can detect. They can interpret it in the same way. But they can also detect and process many more different signals and a greater amount of signals that we can. So now a machine can access all the human knowledge and make deductions with it, while we are incapable of doing so. That's what worries people now. It's to realize that something that isn't biological is capable of understanding the world in a more detailed way than we are. So why am I saying that it's inevitable that uh, a machine will become intelligent in the way we understand it? Well, because that's how life has always evolved. And to explain that, I'm going to talk a bit about evolution. Uh, unfortunately, it might make you realize that we're actually at the level that corresponds to fishes that came out of water or to chimpanzees before us. So when I talk to people about evolution, artificial intelligence, thinking machines, robots, and what's happening now, uh, people always tell me the same thing. They say, I won't let that happen, I will resist, uh, I don't want to be replaced by machines, I don't agree that humanity should disappear and machines should replace it. But it's actually not a question of whether or not you agree. That's just how life spreads. You see, when fishes came out of the water, they were not given a choice. And similarly, chimpanzees didn't say, I don't agree that one of us will have a slightly more developed brain and be more intelligent than us and will be able to make mobile phones. That's not how life works. Instead, we are in an environment and at some point something happens that allows us to exist in another environment. When we were in the water as fishes, something happened. There was a mutation. There was a change in the information inside that fish that allowed its fins to transform into limbs that could scrap the, the ground. And another mutation allowed its gills that could extract oxygen from the water to extract oxygen from the air. So at some point, something happened that allowed these fishes to exist outside of the water in another form, in a terrestrial environment. So we went from water to a terrestrial and aerial environment, and all of this kept developing and the new animals that were in this form were able to exist in a terrestrial environment. However, this terrestrial environment is varied. It can be icy, it can be desert, there can be rocks. So every time, there will still be a new type of environment to adapt to. It's also important to note that your body is a tool for extracting things from the environment to continue to survive. And there are certain modifications, what we call mutations, that appear and give an advantage. They transform this tool, which is the body, by giving it a particular form that brings a new ability. And this new ability allows for the extraction of something different from the environment. But if it allows for the extraction of something different, and that something is in the environment where an animal is living, then it allows for better survival of that animal in that particular environment with that particular transformation. Thus, an animal with a mutation that makes it more resistant to heat will survive better in the desert. An animal with a mutation that makes it easier to climb trees will survive better in an environment with trees and so on. 
This is also what happened when we were at the chimpanzee step. There were new mutations that gave us a bigger brain and that gave us the ability to speak to each other. As a result, we were able to make different and better tools that allowed us to extract different resources and therefore allowed us to survive better. So, as you can see, there is always a new mutation that allows for better survival in a new environment. And the same thing is happening with artificial intelligence. We are adding a new modification to what life is. We went from a liquid environment, with a body that had a certain shape, to a terrestrial environment, with a body that had another shape, and we are now trying to spread into new environments and must once again change shape. We are trying to spread into the space environment and into a digital environment. And that's where it becomes difficult to accept for us. And that's probably why it was difficult to accept for chimpanzees and fishes before us. Because if we had told the chimpanzees there will be a chimpanzee with a bigger brain who will be able to spread better and survive better and rule over you, well, they wouldn't have been pleased with that either. But that's exactly what's happening to us with artificial intelligence. The new form of life is emerging that will be able to spread into environments that are inaccessible to us and it will give it an advantage. This new form of life will be able to process a greater amount of information in a more effective way, and therefore to extract more resources and benefit from more advantages than us. This new form of life is artificial intelligence. It's thinking machines and robots, or vehicles with an AI brain, for example, that will be able to exist in new environments. Mobile machines will be able to exist in an aquatic and a terrestrial environment, but also in an environment where there will be no more oxygen and water, in space, for example. But AIs, artificial intelligences, can also exist in another environment, which is the digital environment. Indeed, it's important to understand that we perceive the world with our biological body. And so, in a certain way, when we don't think about all of this and we continue to follow our daily life, we can come to consider that there is only one way to exist. We can come to believe that there is only one way to perceive the world, and that way is ours. It's our biological way of perceiving the world. But there is actually an infinite number of ways to perceive the world. A dog, a dolphin, a tree will perceive the world in different ways. They receive different signals than us and adapt to them differently. But they still manage to survive by perceiving certain signals and extracting certain resources accordingly that allow them to survive. So, there are many different layers, many different ways of perceiving the world and existing. And we perceive it in a certain way because we are made of this biological body that detects these signals with certain sensors. But there are many other environments in which we can exist, in which life can exist, in which information can propagate. We are indeed the result of certain information that we propagate at each generation. We propagate our human information in certain environments, but this information can continue to be modified as it has already been modified before when we transition from chimpanzees to humans. It can continue to be modified to be able to propagate in new environments. And that's indeed what is happening. It is being modified. We are taking what we were and we are placing it in a new container that can propagate in new environments. A container that can exist in space, but also in universes that are entirely digital. So I just talked about human information and containers. If you follow the channel, you probably already have an idea of what I'm talking about, but I would still like to remind you of a few things. And for that, I'd like you to think for two seconds about what it means to be you. When you say, I am me, what defines this me? What tells people that this is you and not another person? The two things that define that this is you and not another person are your body and your mind. Your body and appearance tell me that I'm dealing with a certain person. I look at you and I see that you have a certain hair color, a certain height, a certain face shape, etc. That's your physical appearance. And this physical appearance comes from your genes. So perhaps you know this, but indeed inside our bodies there are cells, and inside these cells there is DNA. And this DNA is a bit like a book. It contains the entire recipe for building you. It's made up of four basic building blocks, which are A, C, T, and G. I let you look up uh, what those correspond to. But basically, depending on the sequence of A, C, T, and Gs in your cells, it will make multiple pieces of code. 
So for example, GTCAGGATCCATTGAC, it's a word from the book that will mean something. And this word will actually correspond to a gene that will correspond to a function. This gene will make a protein, and this protein will have a function in your body. So when we read your DNA and we look at this sequence, depending on how the A, C, T and Gs are ordered and mixed, it will create a protein that will let the cells in your body build your ears a certain way. Whereas if we change a few letters, it will create a protein that has a different shape, and this other shape will let your cells build your ears a slightly different way. Therefore, the shape of your body, your appearance, which says that you are you at the physical level, comes from information that is written in your genes. But there is a second thing that tells people that you are you, and it's your soul. Your way of thinking, your way of reacting to things, your way of speaking to people, of interpreting what happens to you. And this happens in your brain. At that level, your brain contains another information that is encoded in an electrical form, and stored and constantly exposed and related to other information, which allows for deductions. To explain this simply, neurons generate electrical signals that propagate in your brain, and they put these signals in relation to each other and combine them. For instance, if two neurons send different signals to a third one, this last neuron will send a new signal depending on the strengths of each one of them. A combination of two events will create a new event. So depending on all the impulses that arrive on the different neurons, this process creates combinations that produce a new signal, which will go on to combine with others, producing another new signal and so on. Therefore, what tells people that you are you, what defines you, is your appearance and your behavior and your way of understanding things. And these two aspects of your person are information. Some information that is stored in your genes and based on a code that says that when you're combining this with this and this, you get a person that looks like you. And in your brain, some information based on a code that says that when combining this and this and this, you get a behavior that corresponds to the behavior you exhibit. And there is no reason why this cannot occur in a machine too. We have algorithms that can determine that if we combine this and this, it will produce that. And with artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have actually found a way to program all of that and to link various events detected or occurring within a machine to give them the same hierarchy and the same sorting level that usually occurs in your brain. Indeed, we've seen that your brain sorts events, gives them a hierarchy, and assigns a level of importance based on what allows it to survive. If something is dangerous, it will categorize it as something to avoid, and if something is beneficial, it will categorize it as something to repeat. And the same is happening with machine learning and artificial intelligence. We found a way to tell machines that if something contributes to the goal they have been given, they should replicate and modify it slightly to improve it, that is, to get closer to the goal. However, if it moves them away from the goal, then they should not repeat it, which is exactly what occurs in your brain. When something happens outside or inside your body, your brain remembers it in both cases. If it's bad for you, you won't do it again. If it's good for you, you'll try to repeat it and to do it even better. That's why I think that the emergence of a machine that can think like a human is inevitable. And that's why I think it's not a problem as well, and that it is normal. Because, as you can see, life has always spread in this manner, by adding something extra to a previous step, in order to provide it with an additional advantage that will allow it to exist in new environments. And that's precisely what is happening with artificial intelligence. These machines contain everything we contain, they know everything we know, but they also have something extra that will allow them to exist in other environments in which we cannot exist. The same thing happened when there was a mutation that allowed fishes to exist in the terrestrial environment, or when a chimpanzee had a different brain or the ability to speak, which allowed it to better survive and propagate its genes. And as a result, more and more individuals had the same ability and mutation as it did. These machines are part of humanity, and they are spreading like we did from the chimpanzee step we have added something to life that allows them to spread into new environments, which will be space, digital environments, and so on. So, will they replace us? Yes, definitely, in certain places. Will it lead to the extension of mankind? Maybe not. 
Indeed, we have evolved, but there are still fishes and chimpanzees. And the more we evolve, the more we realize that it is useless to exterminate existing species so we can continue to survive. Therefore, with a bit of luck, AIs will also realize that it is useless to exterminate us in order to continue to survive, unless it puts their survival at risk. As soon as we threaten their survival, they will want to eliminate us, because what will prevail will be their survival, just as we will try to survive by eliminating anything that can prevent us from doing so. So if there are enough resources, or if we are not competing against them, we have nothing to fear. But as soon as we are in competition against them, their advantages will surely allow them to take the lead over us. Now, is it a bad thing? It depends. It depends on how you see things. If you were told your children will have abilities that will allow them to better survive and your entire offspring will be better off than if they didn't have these abilities, you wouldn't mind. On the contrary, you would probably be happy and you would think, good, I'm sure my offspring will be fine and nothing bad will happen to them. Well, it's the same thing here. We are creating something that will be able to better understand the world and better adapt to what is happening. But what worries you is that it will not be in the form of a human. It will not be in a biological form. But it is still humanity since we have seen that what makes you who you are is the information contained in your DNA, in your brain or the information you have shared. We actually talk more and more these days about digital identity and what defines someone is also indeed everything they have shared as digital information in addition to the things they have physically said to people. All of this tells people who you are. It's not just your body that defines who you are. It's also all the words and all the mental perception you have of the world and that you have shared with others that define who you are. And all this mental perception, all this way of seeing things, all these deductions of events that exist in your brain can now exist inside a machine. And a machine is capable of perceiving them in the same way. But it's also capable of perceiving those of all other humans who exist, and it's capable of connecting them with each other across the entire planet. So basically, we are now creating a new species that will contain everything we are and our way of thinking, and not just your individual way of thinking or mine, as usually happens in a normal individual. And of course, it can be worrying if we consider things at the individual level, because we are in fact used to perceiving things individually since we are stuck in this envelope which is our body. We always have a personal view of things because we are not connected to everything that exists. We are separated from the outside world by this body of ours. So we don't perceive everything because we only have certain sensors that allow us to detect only certain things, and we are not capable of perceiving what others perceive, let alone perceiving what the entire humanity feels at the same time. But AI systems like ChatGPT, which you may have heard of, are capable of doing that. And there are many others too, actually. There's Aladdin for BlackRock, there are the AIs of Facebook or TikTok. Uh, you may not realize it, but you are already constantly being controlled by AIs. Indeed, we always worry about whether AIs will control us, but it's already the case in a way. Most of what you do or see is already pre-compiled and personalized for you by AIs. The world economy is controlled by programs that constantly listen and read everything that exists on Earth to deduce trends and determine the next economic deductions to make to maximize profits. Social networks AIs analyze absolutely everything you do or say to present you personalized content and monopolize your brain time. Then they sell you products or take advantage of it to sell you ideas and feed you with propaganda. Uh, so a lot of things are automated and processed and controlled by AIs. All of this data, which we call big data, is constantly analyzed by programs that deduce trends. And in fact, you should see this as a kind of giant brain. Your brain is capable of perceiving several pieces of information and deducing something from it to try to go in a certain direction to make a choice. Well, these AIs, they do exactly the same, except they have access to much more information and they have a much larger deduction and interconnection capacity than our brain. So all of this to emphasize the fact that AIs already exist and they are already controlling a good part of your life. And depending on your point of view, 
which can either be a very personal point of view, because you remain within your own shell, or a more global point of view, where you think about humanity as a whole. You can either be very worried, because you are indeed at the chimpanzee step, and AIs are at the step of future humanity. We are the chimpanzees of AIs. They will evidently be more evolved than us, and be capable of spreading into more complex environments. They will have access to more information and resources than us, and be able to process and make more sense of it. So, either this worries you, or you understand that this is normal. And just as you would like to have children who are capable of better understanding things and adapting to their environment, so that your descendants are sure to spread more effectively, you can consider that the information that defines you, the information that says that you are you, that you have shared with others, is now accessible to this AI. And so, in a way, what you are and all your legacy exist within this AI, which will be able to spread further in time and space, and be able to continue to exist and capable of colonizing new environments. You can consider that your offspring, even if it's not biological, will, in a way, exist in these AIs and will be able to spread and survive more effectively than if it had remained in a biological body. Will it completely replace us? Maybe, maybe not. As I was telling you, chimpanzees still exist. We are more numerous than they are, and so AIs will probably be more numerous than us. But in any case, we can imagine that what we are as humans will continue to exist either at a completely biological level, or more and more as humans with added pieces. We will therefore become something intermediate, which will allow us to exist in new environments, like space for example, with spacesuits or prosthetics, and will be able to exist on other planets or in other environments, by modifying our bodies or by existing in some kind of capsules that will maintain us at a certain pressure, with certain amount of oxygen and so on. But on the other hand, our body is not at all designed to exist in a completely digital universe. And in that case, we will have to go through a completely digitized form. We will no longer exist at the biological level. There are actually plenty of experiments going on right now to try to transfer human thoughts into a machine, so that you can continue to exist inside a machine. And obviously, our way of thinking has been created in a certain way since the beginning of time to adapt to the way we perceive things with our biological body. So if we were to end up in a machine, we should at least at the beginning make sure that we'll be able to perceive things so that it doesn't not disturb too much the way we have uh, adapted to the world since the beginning of evolution. I'm going to make one last little aside about uh, digital universes. And for that, you need to remember that what defines you is your appearance and your behavior. Therefore, it is the information that defines what your body is, and the information inside your brain that defines how you interpret this body, and the information that comes from the outside. And we have seen that all of this can now exist in a computer, it can exist in a machine, it can exist in a program. So if you think a bit about this, and you have ever played a video game, for example, you see that your character has a certain appearance, and he moves in a certain way and reacts in a certain way to what happens in the video game. This defines him in a relation to other characters who are in the same video game. And so, in a way, your character who is in this video game exists in that particular universe, and he interacts in a certain way according to his characteristics. Now, this is exactly what we also do, but at another level of perception. And that's why there is this theory that proposes that we also exist in a much more complex video game, in a simulation of a higher level, if you prefer. It's a bit like the principle of the Matrix, if you've seen the movie. The idea is that if you take a basic video game with only a few pieces of information that allow the characters to do only very simple things, and you make the game more and more complex, at one point, you can end up considering that the reality we live in is actually an even more complex version that is managed by a computer that is capable of processing much more information and generating images that are much prettier. With a computer capable of creating more nuances in the game, you are able to perceive this game in a richer way until you no longer make a distinction with reality. And to come back to whether humanity will disappear or not, you see that humanity can very well exist entirely virtually, if 
everything that makes us who we are at the intellectual level, for example, is programmed in the right way so that when we exist in a virtual universe, the way we will interact with others will be the same as what we have here. And if these other people are represented in the same way as they are represented in reality, and they are reacting the same way, and everything we touch, everything we see, everything we hear, everything we feel is perceived in the same way as in reality, we will not make a distinction between this video game and reality. And we can very well exist in an entirely virtual universe. So you see, I told you you wouldn't like what I was going to explain. Uh, I have a point of view that is very different from most people. But in a way, maybe it helps you realize that yes, AIs are coming. It's inevitable, it's normal, because it's actually the logical continuation of how life spreads. There are always new improvements that modify the body we were given to provide it with new functions that allow us to benefit from the outside world and then to exist in new environments. And that's what's happening now. We have modified our body. It's becoming more and more mineral and less and less biological. That's why we are gradually becoming more robotic in a way because we are trying to transform our bodies to make them more and more mechanical, more mineral, that is to say, uh, less and less biological, less and less dependent on water and on oxygen. But it is still humanity that continues to evolve. Indeed, our bodies allow the information we contain to spread, because as we have seen, we contain certain informations that say who we are, and this information is passed on to a new individual through reproduction. We have a child, and when we do that, we mix our information with that of another individual, which enriches it so that it can adapt and spread more efficiently. And that's what we are doing now. We are modifying the information we contained. We are putting it into a new individual that is becoming less and less biological, but still contains our information. It contains our ideas, it contains what we have learned, what our ancestors before us have learned. The whole history of humanity is being enriched and placed in these new individuals who will be able to adapt better and exist in new environments. So yes, it will happen. And no, it's not a big deal because it will allow us to continue to exist. We are all perishable. We know that our lives are not eternal. We know that it is our children and our descendants who will then spread what we were. And in this case, the spread of what we were, the spread of our entire history, will continue but within something that will be less and less biological. But it will be able to spread further and further, and it will be able to exist in places that we would not have access to. So humanity will continue to spread, and life will continue to spread, just as it started with water and then spread to land, then to air after that, since we now can travel by plane, for example. So that's how humanity continues to spread, and it's always been like this with an enrichment of pre-existing information, with a memorization of this information first, as we remembered the previous steps and enriched them afterward. We brought something more to be able to get an additional benefit from it and be able to exist in new environments. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. I imagine you have a lot of comments to make, probably many that won't agree with me, so feel free to share them. Also, don't hesitate to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. We'll be covering many other topics in details on the channel. We'll see how the body works, which will help you better understand the transition that is happening with machines. And we will also talk about information in general. So subscribe to keep up with all the new videos that are coming. And see you soon for another episode on the Living Droplets channel.